officer fight people. <laughs> oh my gosh. Hello, everybody. And I see there are people here tonight. Excellent. Uh, welcome to uh, our Murder Hobo Inc. Uh, talk show Between the Roles. Uh, let's see. I'm going to go through, of course, the usual stuff. Uh, follow us on Twitch. Follow us on Twitter. Take a look at our old episodes and our YouTube archives. If you want to show the world you're a murder hobo or you or you love gaming and such, check out our store. Lots of great stuff in there. And if you want to discuss D&D or anything else with us or talk about the games you run here, check out our Discord channel. I believe all that info is somewhere on the overlay around us. And if you want to join us as a panelist on the show or you want to... Uh, maybe get a seat at our one shots, which are bi-weekly Saturdays, then you can either DM uh, us uh, at Twitter at mhoboink or email at mhoboink at gmail.com. Uh, before I go on, I'd like to, of course, thank our sponsors, starting with Oddfish Games. Uh, does your game stink? Well, at least the room you're in doesn't have to. Picks up some of their pretty good Ah, pretty good. They're really good. Uh, Venture Sense. I have like the tavern one. It smells so good. Uh, they also are the uh, makers of the Shine system, uh, which is a bunch of writing prompts to help you write your adventures. Uh, oh boy. Uh, and they also have created How to RPG with Your Cat, which is a very hilarious system and it really works well if you have a cat. So. I believe the cat, uh, the cat's behavior with a bunch of items, the uh, cat toys, is how you determine what happens with your, uh, what happens with your characters. So, and then of course our other sponsor is Pirate Dog Dice, and they make really cool commissioned dice. So if you need that special set for a special character, these are my Terran dice from Campaign One. They actually nice. have little musical notes and such in there. Uh, she did a friggin' awesome job, and they roll well. At least they did for the character they were made for. My other characters, they don't seem to roll so well. <laughs> uh, all right. So before I get to the intro, I'm just going to quickly mention, uh, normally we do a bit where we talk about our games that we played this week. But because I want to get to the questions, because we have a pretty good list of questions, uh, I'm just going to mention we had uh, our Cacophony Soap Opera slash Campaign, because it's a campaign. They keep saying that, oh, it's just a soap opera. No, it's a campaign. Uh, we had that on Thursday. And then Saturday, we had a one shot, which may actually end up becoming a two or three shot uh, because there's more that we'd like to do. So so with that, uh, and of course, you could check that out before I say that on our Twitch because it's there for a couple weeks. And you can also check it out uh, on our YouTube uh, channel. So that is all the intro stuff. Now let's get to our GMs. I'm so happy you two joined us. Uh, so let's see, I'm gonna start with, I'll start with uh, GM Jojo. Hi everyone. Uh, go ahead and introduce yourselves and give us a little background about how you get into this whole thing. Well, uh, so hi, I'm Jojo, GM Joe. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at G underscore M underscore Jojo, uh, also on Instagram or my website, JoeTheDM.com. Uh, I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons for uh, 16 years now, something like that. Um, and I've been a professional uh, dungeon master for uh, about two years now, maybe, maybe touch over that. Um, I found it from a EA uh, teacher that uh, at an elementary school who read us fantasy novels, and then that branched out into Dungeons and Dragons and Magic cards. And I've just always had a love for D and D throughout my entire life, and have been playing it constantly. And um, now we're here. How'd you get to be a professional? I saw an article in the New York Times about a full-time dungeon master. That was his. That was his job. That was what he did for his for a living. And I thought, I, and I was like, I am an actor. I might be able to do that. Uh, and so I just started it as just kind of a 
just an offshoot, just kind of a little thing for a little part-time extra money. And now I'm doing it full-time and that is currently my job. That's so cool. All right. And on to DM RJ. Introduce yourself and give us a little bit about how you got into it and how you became a professional. Hi, my name is RJ Cresswell, and uh, I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons since 1993, so for quite a while. Uh, I got into role playing games in high school, like uh, my first year in high school. I met a bunch of new kids, and and uh, they were all into these things called role playing games. Now, previously, before that, I, I had heard about Dungeons and Dragons, uh, and always kind of been interested in it. Watched the cartoon when I was younger and stuff like that. Um, but uh, essentially, I, I, I started playing games with them, and we didn't really start with Dungeons and Dragons. We started stuff with stuff like uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and Heroes Unlimited and Rifts, and kind of like these Palladium systems and stuff. Uh, but I just I started with them and kind of segued into Dungeons and Dragons after that. And in terms of how I got started with this whole professional DMing thing, uh, many many years later, uh, you know I have several friends that I still game with from high school and some local friends that I, I do role playing games with, and they just encouraged me for like years. You know, hey, we've heard about these you know professional dungeon masters. You're really good at this. You enjoy it. You should give it a shot. So I had friends encouraging me for a couple of years and I just never really, you know, pursued it um, until uh, I was having a bit of a, a kind of like DM uh, message back and forth uh, with Devin Chulik from Total Party Chill. And he was telling me about uh, this project that he was working on, uh, kind of like a platform for professional dungeon masters. And I was like, hey, let me get on on that. And, you know, he said, yeah, sure. So uh, I kind of got in uh, on their platform, which is Start Playing Got Games. And I've been doing it since June and really enjoying it. Awesome. And, you know, I think I have you both beat by a little bit. Well, uh, uh, JoJo by quite a bit. I've been playing as I like to introduce myself, since I think there are people here who haven't seen, seen this us yet. Hi, my name is Carol. I am a longtime gamer. I've been playing about 30 years. I started when I was in college and that was uh, that was in 1989 slash 90, somewhere in there. Uh, I'm a long, so long time gamer, occasional GM, and I'm a commission mini painter is my real claim to fame. Um, and uh, I occasionally I host here and I'm on the Thursday Craig campaign and I was in the original campaign. I do the one shots, da 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 da. Uh, that's a little about me, but you're here to see these two. So let's get to the questions. All right. So, of course, the first question is, do you exclusively run D&D or do you handle other rule sets? Uh, let's see, who do I want? All right, I'll go with, you know, I, since I started with you, Jojo, I'm going to go with RJ this time. Okay, so in terms of my professional dungeon mastering, uh, I pretty much exclusively run Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, that being said, I mean, I have done a podcast for uh, another system, uh, Teens on Bikes and Kids in Space. Uh, I, I play other role-playing games. I've never really just offered them, you know, for, for like professional, uh, as a professional kind of thing, I, I certainly would. Uh, but, you know, as of right now, I stay really, really busy uh, just kind of booking Dungeons and Dragons game, games. And I, I probably know that system better than any other system. So I can quite literally have a group that wants to play. They give me just kind of a basic idea of the kind of game they want to play. I help them with characters. And then I have to do very, very little setup. You know, <laughs> I can pretty much walk in almost unprepped other than having their characters ready. So um, uh, I, I pretty much exclusively do D&D, but I like other systems uh, and I certainly would uh, run other systems if people wanted to play them. But as of right now, every player that's contacted me has contacted me has always wanted to do a D&D game. As a, people are asking me questions already, Jesus, all right. I don't know if we're gonna get to any questions because we have already have so many questions. <laughs> All right, Jojo, well, how about your answer? Now, do you run anything else other than D&D &D or just D&D &D for your professional gigs? Since yes. This is actually about the professional stuff. Yes, yeah, similarly, I would say. I, I'm pretty much exclusively running 5e games. Um, those are all of my, all of my current ongoing campaigns are all 5e. Um, and I've 
I've I've prepped and prepared a Call of Cthulhu game, which which sadly never got off the ground, and oh. as well as the Genesis system. So I, I familiarized myself with that one quite extensively, in particular in an Avatar: The Last Airbender setting, um, which I adore. Uh, so at the moment, all my games are D and D five E, but I'm certainly prepped and ready for a few other systems. Uh, Cortex Prime, um, uh, Pathfinder first uh, first edition three point five is is my bread and butter that I got started in, but five E has very much kind of taken that over um, just just by the nature of of the state that we're in. And then uh, yeah, and the Genesis system, Fantasy Flight, Star Wars game is great but uh all of my campaigns currently D D 5e all right that makes i was gonna say it does make sense but there are yeah there are tons of systems so if somebody right. asked you though you would though absolutely you're not absolutely. locked into nah. to uh D &D. i'm sure there are people who are you know because that's what they're comfortable running but yep. Uh, if you could run any campaign in any uh, any campaign for any genre and any green rules that you'd want and have enough players to do so, what what would be the premise or what would you run? Feel free to answer that however you wish. <laughs> uh, let's see. I'll do. I was gonna say I'll do. I'll start with uh, RJ again. I want to vary things here a bit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if I could run any kind of campaign of genre. Yeah, any kind of anything your little heart desire, uh, any rule system, any anything. Yeah, well, I'm kind of actually doing that right now uh, with some of my friends. We we do a stream, and it is Dungeons & Dragons 5th uh, edition streams, but a uh, stream. But uh, I, I'm like a real big fan of horror and quirky stuff and the surreal, and I kind of pitched you know, these players the idea of doing something that was kind of like I mean, you know, definitely Dungeons and Dragons, but also with a little bit of creepiness and something kind of boring, almost like Twin Peaks or something like that. So nice. we're, we're doing sort of this kind of like quirky, uh, slightly surreal, uh, very mild on the horror and creepiness, <laughs> but, but definitely there. Uh, and I've been having a real blast uh, with the game. So I guess, you know, technically I'm, I'm running my ideal game right now, uh, which oh, is nice. like a, a, a 5e game but with but with kind of like the surreal and, and some horror thrown in and stuff like that as well. Awesome. You know what? I'm going to throw it out there, but that's basically uh, the cred campaign, which is Cthulhu rises, everyone dies. It is the Sandy Peterson D 5 E rules. So mm -hmm. we're doing basically the same. You guys should watch it. It's good. I'm in it. So what can I say? Um, <laughs> but he is good. If I do say so myself, I'm having a great time playing it. <laughs> But yeah, it's funny because it said how it's 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 similar to what your favorite thing is, and it's it's a lot is a lot of fun. Okay, Jojo, what if you could run anything you wanted ever? What would you want to do? I'm I mean like uh, kind of similarly, I am doing I'm doing like something that I've always wanted, which I'm I'm running multiple campaigns all set in my own homebrewed world where all of the action is happening at the same time. So. The aftermath of one group is the follow-up quest of another, and oh, that's and, so and, cool. and like like one of my groups destroyed a city, and then the <laughs> uh, the next group came into the aftermath, and and now are dealing with like these warring factions. So it, having this expansive world that is growing and ship, shifting and shaping by all of these different groups is is happening, and it's. Uh, this ever uh, ever flowing narrative, and that that to me is, has has been a dream, and ha I've been able to to do that for for a couple of years now. So that's that's been amazing. Uh, other than that, I probably want to run a Curse of Strahd game. That'd be cool. Oh, that is! I have played Curse of Strahd. It is yeah. amazing. If you care, if you want to see your players or your PCs in that game go dark, just run that. It's just oh, yeah. it's the only time I've ever had a hero go dark was nice. in that thing it's a really good game um all right if i could interject something what's that carol would you mind if i interject something real quick yeah go ahead go ahead go ahead i just said would you mind okay I, I was just gonna say i'm currently one of my professional games right now is a curse with stride game oh. and it's with a group of players that was doing um doing rhyme of the frost mated fighters prior oh. to that yeah, yeah. and uh if y'all haven't done rhyme of the frost maiden that gets real dark at some point. Oh, and my no. I, like, I, oh okay, I've read it. Just... That's, that's, 
We just started that same group. My- the Cruz is just started Rhyme of the Frost Faded. Oh, freaking God. What am I in for? <laughs> yeah. Well, my Rhyme of the Frost Maiden group was like, okay, this this got a little too dark for, for some of us. Uh, we want to pause on this real quick. And and, and let's play Curse of Strahd instead, you know? Because nice. they were like, we want to do horror, but we want to do horror light, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's very funny. I love that. Oh, my God, that's hilarious. But, yeah, we're playing. We just started Rhyme of the Frost Maiden oh, like a week ago. So, oh, Wicked. boy, yeah. So, I mean, have a second character that goes dark. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so I'll start with Jojo for the next question. All right. Describe a moment from one of your past game sessions that make you just really love being a dungeon master or a GM. Uh, I'm, uh, I mean, constantly. I feel like like every session there's something that a player will do where I'm just like, yes. Um, but uh, just this last, last Saturday, um, <laughs> my, my all ladies group, uh, the bloody babes. They um, I love they it. were they were facing off with a Medusa in the sewers, and the druid had shape shifted into an octopus and was trying to fight the Medusa with a scimitar with its tentacles, um, and it had a mirror in another tentacle. So they were they were trying to find a way to like deflect its gaze attack. It was they were having a really tough hard time with it. What the druid ended up wanting to do was like. Can I use my ink cloud if I'm not in water? And I was like, well, it's kind of like a, it's supposed <coughs> to be underwater. And uh, she's like, well, could I get right up to it and squirt her in the face? And I was like, that will take some work. So the fighter and the ranger both use their turns to pick up the octopus move and prep and throw and they rolled very well on all of their checks they spent an entire round on that setup she got a grapple check inked the medusa in the face and she could no longer use her gaze attack and that was nice amazing outside of the box thinking by the way is one of my favorite things in this game so oh yeah i mean that's absolutely I, i love i love posing a problem and seeing what the players will do with it Ophelia the giant octopus is so amazing. Someone just wrote that. That sounds amazing. <laughs> All right, RJ, what is like been one of your favorite moments or a moment that makes you really love to be a dungeon master? I, I really kind of loved when I, I sort of set up my players, but I do so like months or weeks in advance so that they don't see it coming. So I've got two examples and I'll just share one of them, but the two examples involve doppelgangers, which I've only used twice. And <laughs> both times it was very successful and really awesome. So uh, the most recent time was in that stream that I was talking about earlier, the kind of quirky horror type stream or whatever. I've got a group of four players. Um, uh, and it, basically what happened is my group of players well, I said four players, but five players, uh, they, they kind of split their party just a little bit. And they, they <laughs> went into deep and dark forest. Now, the, the stream is called the Grimwood Saga, and the Grimwood is just like this dark kind of fairy tale forest. And uh, they had to go there for some reason. And they decided to split their party, two of which were going in to kind of like see this, this sort of witch of the woods, this mother forest kind of figure or what have you. And the other ones were separated from them. Uh, because they found very quickly that the forest didn't seem to want those other three characters in there. It was really only interested in two of them. So these two players, they, they went off to uh, meet this, this forest mother. And in doing so, you know, I won't, I'll make it kind of like a long story short, but they end up making this deal with them. And one of them, the, the party's bard, uh, ends up trading her eyes with this forest mother. Uh, and making this deal to to try to help save a friend because the forest mother is just like, okay, your eyes are, you know, beautiful when you cry or, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and, and she makes this deal. Well, kind of going on at the same time, the other three essentially meet these doppelgangers of the other two characters, you know, uh, and the other two, the doppelgangers are like trying to lead them out of the forest, you know, uh, and I'm having my players play both their characters and the doppelgangers. Yes. You know, so they're interacting, playing as, as the doppelgangers. 
Uh, so they're, they're talking to these other players and they're leading and they're like, okay, yeah, we went, we met with a forest mother and basically she told us what we need to do and it, it's going to take us outside of the forest. So they're leading them one way. And then eventually I just have them all kind of come back together. But when they come back together, uh, the two real characters are acting strangely. You know, they're talking to one another. And I just sort of picked the perfect moment for them to kind of like meet back up. You know, I've been saying, like giving clues, like you're, you know, uh, you're noticing this, you're hearing voices off in the distance. And one of the players was just like, they, they had been having like this really great conversation with two real characters. And one of them just made this remark like, okay, yeah, so uh, you're just going to keep feeding my meat feeding me my backstory, you know, or something like that. And I was like, okay, that's the moment that they come in because, you know, uh, it's like these two characters, they hear something about feeding me my backstory and one of them has strange eyes, you know? So, you know, it, it kind of made them uh, kind of think that the doppelgangers were like the real characters or, you know, what have you. That's great. I mean, as players, they knew it wasn't such, but, you know, it was just this really awesome moment where everything just kind of came together perfectly. Uh, and, you know, all the players were just, you know, like, RJ, you set us up or, you know, whatever. And it was just, it was a really fun moment for me as a DM. Good job. Good Great. job. Really good. All right. I'm going to actually combine the next two. I'm debating when I was going to combine these, but um, considering what this, this particular Twitch stream is about. But, uh, all right. So what are your thoughts on power gaming, min-maxing, or murder hoboing? And how do you deal with, like, disruptive, players that there are definitely a lot there are a lot of gms out there who would figure who would say that all three of those would be can be disruptive types of players mm -hmm. um it's also like rules lawyering and things like that too so how would you what are your thoughts on like that stuff and what are your how do you deal with like a disruptive player on a professional gig not your home games right uh let's see any mini miny mo all right jojo uh, well, I mean, uh, power gaming has its place. Min maxing is its own yeah. thing. Like it's, 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 it's all about styles of play. And, uh, when I get to know my players, it's, uh, you, you pick up pretty quick on, on what a player is going for in a game, uh, murder hoboing less so that 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 can be something that creeps in slowly. Uh, and there's nothing inherently wrong with, no. wandering adventurers who don't have a home who kill everything uh but there is uh there there's something to be there's something missing from the role play experience if you are only worrying about the numbers if you're a player who's just fixated on how much damage you can do and uh uh, uh obliterating your enemies that's great that's fun but there is a whole other aspect to that game which is the role play and the getting into the characters that i feel like they're missing out on uh and for those power gamers and for those min maxers that i have in my games i i i just subtly pepper in moral questions occasionally and have them yeah. question themselves feed them in, uh, feed them uh, uh, dreams or see if you can suss out some guilt if they've got any um, <laughs> and as for disruptive players I mean for the most part if if like a if a player is like stepping on other people's toes constantly or telling them what to do I'll just kind of be like well let like let this player sort that for themselves or let them do that if it becomes a constant issue that you know then that's something we'll discuss after the game or outside of the game to be like ensure that everyone is having a good time yeah i said and I, by the way just because i put the, everything in one question there it doesn't mean that i really think that min maxing mig max is power gamers and murder hobos yeah. are necessarily problems it's it depends on you know it's, it depends on the gm i think a lot of times too yeah. and there have been a lot of viewpoints and how yeah i mean i know for myself for myself when i get to be a player i'm <laughs> very much a bit of a min maxer like I, I i very much find a quirk that i want to fully exemplify with a character and just kind of go all in on it but then i still you know ground it with role play and whatnot but um yeah i would say those things aren't inherently bad but taken to the extremes is when it becomes a problem amen all right uh dm rj uh same question um thoughts on power gaming min maxing murder hoboing and and how do you deal with problem players or disruptive players who may take that to an extreme okay. on a professional well, I, i'd say uh, sorry right right uh I, 
It's okay. Uh, I would say with playing Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition, uh, in terms of the min maxing power game and stuff like that. I don't think it's really as big of an issue as I've seen in some other systems. Some other systems you can get real true. country and sort of manipulate oh, what's yeah. going on with the rules. Very like true. With D and D five E, I mean, you know, I, I think I could honestly have a player that had like eight teams in every single stat, and it really wouldn't change the game that much. You know, uh, not that anybody ever gets that, but but it honestly, seriously, would not change the game that much. I don't think. Um, I fortunately, uh, fortunately, uh, I've not really experienced any players who you know, are extremely disruptive or anything. There have been like a couple of occasions where, you know, I've had uh, some players, and this is especially true in groups that, because uh, a lot of my uh, paid games that I do, I have like returning groups and like ongoing campaigns and stuff like that. So I've got players who play with each other and we've kind of become friends and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, they kind of get to know each other, what their characters can do. And sometimes they'll sort of like try to step on, you know, uh, toes uh, unintentionally, but like suggest you know, like, Hey, you should use this spell right now or whatever, you know? And, and I kind of try to do like what, uh, what Dojo was talking about and, and just say, you know, let them play their character, you know, let them make the decisions for their character. Uh, you know, if y'all have strategies you want to work out outside of combat, that's the time to do it. Not when we're, you know, fighting this monster, because you can't have this five minute conversation about what, you know, uh, things will be synergistic, what, what, what abilities they have are going to be synergistic with, with your abilities. You know, that's not going to happen in combat, really, uh, what you're trying to communicate. Uh, that's probably the biggest disruption that I ever have uh, with, with professional games, because I think most people who show up for my games have uh, came there earnestly wanting to have a good time wanting other people to have a good time and and most of them have taken the game you know pretty seriously and been some really good role players you know um so uh like i said uh, a lot of those things haven't been an issue with me in my professional games and, and like i said uh, once more given that i do dnd 5e the min max and power gaming not a super big issue you know i, I think i've got one group uh, they have obviously, they're, they're long-term friends and they have obviously spent some time outside of the game talking about how they can use their character's abilities together and stuff like that. And uh, they are very efficient oh, yeah. in combat, you know, uh, but it's not, it's not things that happen. It's not things that happen like in, in game time, you know, so yeah. they don't communicate during combat. They just already know these are the things that we're going to do and they work together and, you know, uh, but, you know, I'm okay with that. Uh, people are paying me to have a good time. And if, 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 you know, trying to make the strongest character or whatever is what they're going to have fun with, it's definitely not going to break my game, you know? Uh, so I, and so I think it's been a huge issue for me. Yeah, yeah. And I think you're right, especially with the way, you know, skills and such work, you know, where you're limited. I think you're, you're absolutely right. And I mean, you know, most it adds really is a plus four to your dice roll. So, you know, yeah. if you roll in that one every single time, it's not going to freaking matter. <laughs> All right. So a couple quick questions. You can give me quick answers. Um, so because we want to get through these. Uh, so do you travel to your games? Do you host your games? Or do you run remotely? Uh, RJ. Okay, so right now I run every single game remotely unless it's like a game with my daughters or something like that uh i no longer play local games uh everything i do is is on the computer now once covid19 is not as big an issue or whatever <laughs> then i probably will offer professional games in person but as of right now everything's on the computer for me would you host them or would you travel if you uh, if we're talking about person. professional games yeah yeah, so if it's, if it's professional games, I would probably travel to the games. Okay. Uh, but prior to, like, COVID and everything, you know, I had my groups, and I would always host games at my house and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but I probably wouldn't do that for a professional game. I would probably travel for professional games. All right, that's fair. All right, Jojo, how about you? Uh, due to COVID, yeah, all my, all my games yeah. are currently online. I mean, that online. makes sense. <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, I've got very familiar with Roll Twenty. Uh, but uh, before before COVID, I was hosting all, all the games at my place, and I'm so excited to run games in person again because I have uh, uh, I've d uh, done up my garage as a dungeon slash wizard yeah. room with a fully with a with a gaming table that it, uh, uh, that has a bunch of terrain and all kinds of cool minis, and like I got to use that for a month. Like I got it and I got to use it for, for I think less than a month before COVID hit and everything uh, uh, turned oh. online. 
So, sad. you know, it makes it makes me sad. But like also I because of COVID, I've been able to uh, um, uh, my, my partner and I, we've painted the garage and we've set it up so that it's a much uh, a much more friendly uh, play space now. It actually uh, has room. We've got uh, uh, got a garage door that can open to allow airflow. We've got curtains and galaxy uh, paintings and a dungeon wall. It's it's beautiful, beautiful. And I'm so excited to run games in person again. So I will be absolutely hosting games when, uh, when restrictions are lifted. All right. Uh, all right. Next question. Contra uh, blah, 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 blah. Contract. Here we go. I'm reading two questions down here. Campaigns or one shots? Joe. Both. Okay. I, 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 yeah, I run, I run both. Like I, I have, I have five to six weekly campaigns at the moment. So, so that doesn't crazy. leave, a, that doesn't leave a lot of room for one shots. Uh, but no. occasionally I will pepper in one shots throughout there. Um, and uh, and I, I have like, I have a, I have a whole menu of, of one shots uh, that I've concocted over, over these last couple of years um, that are just super fun. And I always love seeing what different groups will do with them. Like the, like I have a, so you want to be a wizard one shot, which is just an entire wizard uh, uh, final exam graduation. Um, and I've ran that three times and each time it has just been a debacle of chaos. Uh, <laughs> you can run it here. You always come here. We, we, you know, we, we take GMs that, uh, that want to GM here or, or better mm -hmm. yet, we take GMs who want to play, who want to get away from <laughs> yeah, like so you have. I'll, but doing a, doing a, uh, uh, most of, most of my one shots are designed for minimum three to four hours. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's I, fair. I, a lot I of them cinch are. Them, I have to cinch them up to a two hour To a two hour thing. Yeah. That's what. Probably can be done though. I've done a two hour game before. All right. Uh, RJ, what do you, do you, uh, campaigns, one shots, both, um, uh, option, other, other answer? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I definitely do one shots and campaigns, but as of right now, I run more campaigns than one shots. And that's just because, like I said earlier, a lot of the groups that I work with, they came, they played with me, they enjoyed playing under me as a DM, and they enjoyed playing with each other, and they decided, hey, let's keep this going. So um, probably my my most popular game is is uh, called D and D Drunken Heist, based off of the module Dragon Heist. You know, yes. just this idea of like getting together oh, playing this module, and, and then having like few drinks together as we're playing and stuff like that. You know, not getting slushed or anything like that, but just yeah. you know, a more relaxed kind of laid back sort of atmosphere. And most of my groups that have played like the initial adventure, you know, have wanted to come back for more sessions. And and kind of the way I did it is is I set up that initial adventure uh, as kind of like a one shot, but a segue into Dragon Heist if you want to continue playing on from there. You know? So uh, it's so the it's the, the hit. Question, I, it's the yeah, hit the to get you. It's yeah. the it's the it's yeah. the it's the little it, taste yeah. that gets you into the hardcore stuff. I see how it works. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, finish right. what you're going to say. Um, no, I was just going to say, uh, uh, I, I definitely offer both of those. Uh, but as of right now, my, my long-term campaigns are keeping, I mean, I'm having to turn down a lot of people just because I game most nights out of the week. You know, I have a group every Monday. I have a group every Friday. I have two groups and they alternate Wednesdays. And then I stream on Tuesdays and I stream on Thursdays. So, and I've got a group that does every other Saturdays and occasionally I do one shots one shots on Saturday. So I have to turn down a lot of, you know, offers for one shots and even campaigns and stuff like that. Cause I'm, I'm literally gaming most nights out of the week. Time. Wow. Okay. Time. Yeah. It's time today. Okay. So yeah. this is end of thing. So I'm going with the, okay. So this is something that kind of popped into my head. Um, what, all right. So how do you decide what to charge? What costs do you incur and what forms of payment do you take? Uh, let's see, uh, RJ. Okay, uh, so when I first started out, uh, which was in June, I just thought $25 a player sounded reasonable. Uh, and I kind of started with that. And I've got, uh, I've got a campaign that's sort of like grandfathered in to that price. Yeah. And then after doing it for a little bit, $50 an hour sounded good. You know, uh, I mean, I, I didn't base that off of anything at all whatsoever. It just, it seemed like a reasonable price for me, uh, So you know, for running a game for. Sorry. So is that for like the whole, you have a question? yeah, $50, is that for the whole table basically? 
Yeah. So, so at first I charged per player, you know, I was like $25 per player, you know, three or four hours is what we'll run. Uh, And then since then I've kind of changed it to just $50 an hour and all the players can get together and sort out how they want to pay that or whatever, you know, and I do like three hour minimal games and, you know, I'll do more than that if you want, you know, but, uh, but my, my going rate right now is $50 an hour. And I didn't base that on anything. It just seemed like a fair number to me. So maximum number of, uh, in that case and maximum number of number of players that you would ho- uh, host how many i have i have recommended to almost everyone you know four to six players you know uh i'll, I'll definitely do under that if you want to uh, and i'll do over that if you want to but i just kind of let everybody know if we exceed six players it's going to diminish the fun probably, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I, I mean, I've definitely run some professional games with seven players before and, and it's not bad uh, locally. No, in seven person, not terrible. Yeah, no, in Go. person, I, I would run up to 11 or 12 person games, but that was more like, oh a party, my God. you know, uh, <laughs> and, and, and I always did it because people always cancel, you know? So I was yeah. like, okay, yeah. we've got, we've got 12 players. If four people cancel, we still got a really big game, you know? Um, <laughs> But yeah, as far as the professional games, though, I recommend no more than six, but I'll allow it. I'll allow up to uh, seven or eight, you know. Um, what kind of cost do you incur as a dungeon master? Or is it really just like transportation? If you were going to travel a game, is it just transportation costs and maybe whatever minis and terrain and thing? Is there anything like that isn't obvious to, that you kind of a cost you incur for your business? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, given that I do virtual games exclusively at this point, I do pay for like a professional account for like Zoom or, you know, what have you. So that's a recurring that's monthly cost. And, you know, I mean, I'm not, I'm not super big into the virtual tabletops. I mean, I think they're great. I think they do awesome things, but I have a lot of minis and a lot of set pieces and stuff like that. So uh, I just set up a cam, you know, I've got my one camera on me and then I set up a camera on that I call the battle cam and I just put it on terrain and minis and stuff like that. And I'm always acquiring new minis or maps or set pieces or what have you. So, so yeah, I I have kind of cost uh, where I'm always kind of like purchasing stuff purchasing stuff for my games. Uh, and, you know, I think it's one of the things that really impresses the players once they get there, you know, like when they say, you know, okay, I, I want to have an Arctic Fox familiar. And then I just reach over and grab an Arctic Fox and I've got one like right here for them, you know, or something yeah. like that. I always loving, I love having the perfect or near perfect mini for whatever the situation calls for. So That's I'm always what I do. It. Hey, you ever want anything painted special? <laughs> That's what I do. Uh, okay. Uh, was that, oh, what form of payment do you take? Do you PayPal or Venmo or? Well, I do, my, I do my professional dungeon mastering through startplaying.games. So it is a platform where, oh. um, where players just kind of go and they sign up for it. And they actually pay through startplaying.games. And, you know, I get, I get a payout from startplaying.games. So, Interesting. Um, okay. Yeah. Never heard of it. So <laughs> it's, it's basically, it's a direct deposit. I've, I've seen it. It's, like, it's right, pretty sweet. Yeah, I've been really happy with it, you know. Uh, and like I said, uh, it's just it's basically a direct deposit right into my bank account. You know, I can just pay it out whenever I want to, it just to cruise in there until I hit the payout button. Nice. Awesome. All right, how about you, uh, Jojo? How yeah, so do you, I, yeah, what do uh, you do? Uh, so I, uh, all, everything is pretty much done by e-transfers now for me because I'm I'm running all my games just exclusively through myself. So I'm I'm like in my own business. Uh, and, uh, I also do, I've, I've been, I started when I first started, it was just 20 bucks per person for, it was just kind of the standard that I went with. Um, uh, and then this year I just, I upped it to 25 per person, um, as it's just kind of like you're buying into a weekly game slot that, uh, uh, for the campaigns as they go. And then I have a flat rate for the one shots, which I think is either 150 or 200, um, which is, and then it would just be dependent on how many people are partaking. Um, four to six as well is kind of my general rule of thumb okay, for yep. games. Um, trying trying to have seven players in an online game is is ju- it just slows everything down so much. I've I've ran seven in person, that's fine, uh, and the the gaming table that I have can seat 
seven players plus me comfortably. So that's so that's that's like the most that I would host as an in-person game. Um, but yeah, five five. Uh, all of my campaigns are either five or six players. All right. Uh, yeah. And, oh, anything else? Before I, go uh, I don't think. So. Oh, costs. Uh, similarly. Oh yeah, so costs like, you incur. I guess uh, the paint. Uh, Paint, terrain, minis. Paint, terrain, minis. <laughs> uh, subs subscriptions to different Patreons oh, yeah. uh, for, yep. for digital maps. Um, nice. Uh, uh, and uh, so like D&D Beyond. So I've, I've got like all the books on there. I purchased the books as well. So I just like accruing as much D&D related material so that I just have a plethora yeah. of options for me. And f especially for the first year of it, it was a lot of that was what kind of the money did it just went back into the business went back into purchasing minis purchasing uh, uh books and acquiring uh things in order to make the play experience more immersive that's that you know what that's that's a lot of that's how a lot of businesses get launched basically yeah. you take the money your first years or first few years yeah. and you throw it right back in to make yeah. it better and better and better and valuing your prep time is also important yes that's true because your prep time is part of your time you're devoting to that game so when you exactly. figure your cost you should absolutely include your time to write that scenario yeah. um let's see uh, do you have contracts formal contracts with your clients or do you is it just you know um like i don't have contracts with mine mm. i just basically you know i have a system where i get paid and then they get their minis do you have something like that or do you have a formal contract I have a social contract with them. It's not like I don't. Yeah, uh, okay. I don't have. I don't have like a written thing, but I do. I um. I do have it written <laughs> out what like my expectations are. Uh, I don't have them all like sign it to be like you have signed and you will commit to the to these things. Uh, uh, I've been very fortunate with all of my groups thus far that they uh, uh, everyone has been. Uh, 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 understanding and uh, uh, keeping up with myself as I'm learning this business and that just kind of started uh, uh, and exploded uh, uh, over the course of these last uh, couple of years. So, uh, and it's a, it's an ongoing conversation between myself and the players. And so I, I always make sure that no one is left out of the loop and any business changes that go in, I make sure that there's a couple of months of, of headway before I implement those changes. Okay. Okay. RJ, do you have a formal contract or do you just, yeah, or I like that social contract. It's kind of the same thing. I don't really have a formal contract with my players at all whatsoever. Um, you know, kind of when I first start playing with a group, uh, we never really have a session zero, but kind of at the beginning of the group, I always, you know, talk to them and like, hey, we're here to have fun. Uh, these are some things that might not let people have fun, you know, especially groups that don't know one another. Um, but, you know, I just have like some, you know, hard and fast rules, you know, no sexism, racism, homophobia, you know, stuff like that. stuff that's probably yeah, not going to yeah. be an issue anyway. But I just throw it out there, you know, just to make sure, you know. Uh, no. but, and let everybody know those are unwelcome behaviors at the table. I want everybody to feel welcome, except for racist, sexist, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I just, I, I, I have a very quickly kind of, uh, a very quick kind of like session zero with them. And then we start playing. And like I said, it's, it's really, I've really not had any issues, you know, so I've been fortunate with that. Okay. Do you, oh, do you, one quick thing. Um, do you guys go through uh, what people are comfortable with? Like a consent? Yeah, oh, lines and veils. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you do? Uh, uh, I, I, that's that's been uh, an expanded thing that I've kind of uh, uh, adapted. I actually I've collected a, a, a survey that I, I haven't sent out. I think to all of my groups yet, but um, I do I do kind of check ins over the course of the campaign, um, and especially if uh, uh, if I'm if there's a rotation of players if like if a new if a new character has come in or a new player has come in that i haven't played with before uh doing check-ins for phobias or triggers and that sort of thing uh and i assume then you have something too rj along those lines yeah uh yeah uh usually kind of in that little little uh talk that i have in the uh the, like before we start playing and a lot of times i'll do some like virtual communication like emailing or you know 
uh, DM or, or whatever uh, prior to us starting playing. And I always let people know if anything could, you know, trigger you, bother you, whatever, please let me know and I'll make sure not to include those elements. Uh, and, you know, if something comes up in the game, please let me know and we'll stop and we'll, you know, kind of like, you know, change course. Like, for example, uh, you know, I said that to some of my players and one of them, you know, didn't think to tell me that that they had a fear of spiders, you know. So I threw some spider monsters at them, just creepy spiders, and they were like, "Oh, hey, I don't like this." And I was like, "And they were like, we can finish this encounter, you know." And uh, uh, so they so they were okay with finishing the encounter, and I was like, "Okay, going forward, we won't have any spider monsters, you know." Yeah. Uh, so so yeah, I mean, you know, I, I let people to I ask people to let me know if there's anything that would bother them, and and I try to. They're clear at that, you know. Okay, we're doing good. We're doing good. We're doing good. Okay, so any restrictions on age or experience level? Do you teach new players, for example? And what about children? Your game's mature audience is only like this podcast, or <laughs> or are you okay with having kids? And how young? Uh, all right, RJ. <laughs> okay, um, the couple of. <laughs> The couple of official games that I have listed on Start Playing That Games, uh, one of them is Drunken Heist, and I have that clearly marked 21 That's and up. That's from Mature, yeah, yeah obviously. Hang out for. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're not going to come hang out with a bunch of adults, you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> drinking beer and stuff like that. Um, and the other one is uh, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden, which, again, as I kind of mentioned earlier, yeah, that can go dark real fast at a certain point in the game. So that one's an 18 and up game. That being said, I have plenty of parents contact me, you know, with those being the only two games I have listed. And, you know, they ask me if I'll run a game for their teenagers or their young kids or whatever. And, well, I mean, I'm a middle school art teacher and I do a Dungeons and Dragons club. So I'm used to playing with kids. So if a parent contacts me and asks me to do a game for their children and their children's friends, I'm, I'm all about it because I am a teacher. Uh, and like I said, I do a middle school D&D club. So I enjoy gaming with kids. Uh, and I'll do it, but uh, my only rule with that is is uh, if there are going to be children that have joined the game uh, other than your own, you have to have their parents make contact with me so I know that their parents are definitely okay with you know them playing yeah. D&D and stuff like that. So I, I require getting some form of communication from you know parents. Uh, but I mean, I as a professional dungeon master, I've done several uh, games with both young children and teenagers, and they've all been pretty fun, you know, so uh you know uh, officially speaking my games are 18 and up or 21 and up but if a parent wants me to run something for them for their kids I, I am not opposed to that at all and experience level obviously then you don't mind teaching the game to others do you oh no and, uh, kids, yeah. i have done this with yeah i have done this with a few groups not just kids but like grown-ups who have never played a role-playing game before i've had multiple groups where they're like, okay, we're brand new. And I'm like, okay, well, we can do this two ways. One, we can either just jump into the game. I'll explain things as we go along. Or I can teach you how to play as we play the game. And I have done multiple sessions where, you know, not only are we playing the game, but we dissect it as we're playing it. And the groups nice. that have elected to do that uh, have all found yeah. it extremely helpful. You know, in terms of like, these are the dice we use. This is what we might use them for. And then even into the, okay, here's what I did here. And I know y'all are thinking about running a game by yourself. So whoever's going to be the dungeon master, here's why I did this particular thing that I did, you know? So uh, nice. you know, I, I've had multiple groups where, I, where I've kind of broken it down on a meta level. You know, we're having fun, we're playing a game, but we're also talking about the game as we're playing it as well so that they can learn how to play D&D on their own. Okay, Jojo, you uh, kid, do you do you DM with kids? Uh, I, I have, yeah, actually, I have a, a Sunday afternoon game that's a family. So it's a, oh, a mo mom, awesome. mom and dad and then uh, uh, three kids. Oh, uh, nice. So so that's fun. And that's, it's obviously, it's its own brand. It's its own game, right? Yeah. All of all of my other games are, are people who are older than 20, I think. Obviously, uh, though, you're not you know. against it. Not against uh, having No, kids. I, I, kids are great. Their imaginations run wild. I like seeing <laughs> what they do with things. Um, I'm happy to teach people, uh, like, I think half of my games, if not more, are all people who've never played D and D before, and that's how they started. Uh, and I pretty much for for most of them, I would 
run a one shot first for them with pre made characters to be like, this is the game, these are the things. And then they all, and then all the ones that came back, they're like, then we do a session zero, we build their characters, flesh out uh, uh, the part of the world that they're starting in, and then they have free reign of the world. Okay, let's see, we got 10 more minutes. All right, so how do you get the word out about your services? And somebody brought up, do you do conventions? Is that one of the possible ways? But what are all the ways? Uh, yeah, and do you do conventions? Uh, RJ. Okay, uh, so to answer that question about getting the word out, I honestly don't do anything. <laughs> uh, I, have a, I have a little following on Twitter and occasionally I'll post stuff about professional dungeon mastering there. Uh, I'm always posting something about D&D. But I don't think most of the people who played with me came from, you know, Twitter. Uh, I have just been fortunate enough that, you know, several groups have found me on the website startplaying.games. And, so and just that, I, really? I really haven't advertised. Yeah, it's just been that, you know, I've been on there and people have found me. And, you know, uh, like I said, a lot of the people who initially started playing with me just stuck around. And that composes like most of my groups that I play with. Uh, and, you know, I still get weekly, you know, uh, uh, queries about you know like like playing you know games a one shot or a campaign or what have you uh, so I don't really advertise and I I wow. consider myself fortunate that I haven't really had to do anything it's been very hands off on on me you know I just let it come to me and if I can take a game I take it and if I can't you know I I say I hope you find another good dungeon master but unfortunately I can't do it at this time um, that's cool but, yeah, but do you really do advertise. convention do you go to conventions when we had in-person conventions? Uh, yes, I've gone to some local conventions and been like a dungeon master, but I didn't do it like as a professional getting paid. Yeah. You know, I got, no, no, I mean, no. I, I meant, would get paid in swag, you know, or. Yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because I mean, I've done, I've, I've gone out to Gen Con and done uh Paizo stuff, you know, run a nice. Pathfinder out there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a great place to meet people and, and advertise, basically advertise yourself. You're actually, you're actually, you can show your product off yeah, basically totally. to, to, to your totally. audience. What about you, Jojo? Do you, uh, um, how do you, do you advertise, how do you find your business? Uh, word of mouth has been pretty much what I've done. Like m most of my, m all of my initial groups were like former co-workers uh in in the in the restaurant industry uh and then that <laughs> kind of pillowed out from there from them telling their friends and then uh other people approaching me sending me messages people who wanted to do a one shot then wanted to do a campaign i do have a website but i i think i've only i've only gotten a few hits off of that and i'm also on twitter but uh all of my yeah all of my games they're primarily i have all been from word of mouth where one player has told someone else um and then they gather wow. their together and get a campaign going so it's uh uh yeah so i mean i've you know uh, i've attempted to to do some advertising here and there uh but again i've been very fortunate with the groups that i have uh with their dedication and then uh the new the new faces that come have all wanted to stick around so i, I feel very fortunate on that front as well that's really cool. And do you, is it, are you, I, think I would you love to do conventions. I would you love should. There's so much fun. I know. I'm, I'm, I, I was signed Once up for, back. I was signed up for the, the one, um, that, the, the tabletop, uh, oh, I don't remember it's the name now, uh, is, is in Van, in Vancouver and it was going to be happening in April of COVID. Aww. So I was, I was, I was super stoked to, 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 to go to, to my first convention as a professional dungeon master, but pandemic. I know. Hey, you know what? That's other than the last two questions, which I'm going to leave for the last two questions. That's like all the main questions. So nice. let's see, let's see. Um, I just, there was one question, uh, Kyle, Kyle tossed up a couple questions and it was like, do you, do you DM for free at all? Um, not you know, anymore. you don't have time. I get the feeling neither one of you guys has any time to run a. Uh, I feel that I feel like that you neither one of you has actually any time to run anything for free or any private home games, do you, uh, Mister Six Six Campaigns of Friggin' Week? I don't know how the hell you do that, man. Uh, how many campaigns are you running, yeah, so RJ? How many times do you run a week? 
Okay, so I hold on. I'll need to think about that. So I've got a campaign on Tuesday, a campaign on Thursday, a campaign on uh, Monday, a camp two campaigns on Wednesday, alternating Wednesdays, another campaign on Friday, a distinct campaign on Saturday. Uh, mm -hmm. My daughters and I play off and on. So, um, and then I have games that I occasionally play with friends. So, uh, but it's not really. They used to be campaigns, but they're not really campaigns anymore. It's just when we can get together and play. Uh, but to answer your question about do I run free games, um, I mean, my streams are, you know, technically free. I mean, th those players aren't paying, but also at the same time, I almost wish I could be paying them because they're, you know, doing this thing with me. We're streaming together and stuff like that. Oh. Uh, but those are free games, and I I'm not opposed to playing free games anymore at all whatsoever. In fact, after COVID, uh, after COVID and I can start having my friends come back over to my house, I definitely intend to pick up some campaigns that I used to, used oh, to nice. run, you know, nice. uh, with friends coming over and stuff like that. Uh, but yes, as you surmised, uh, I am very low on time right now. Cause in addition to all the games I run, uh, I'm also a dad, I'm also a husband, I'm also a teacher and I'm working on my last, uh, grad class for, uh, the certification program I'm doing right now. So I have like no time at all. Like I'm always booked. The only day I'm like, never booked this Sunday and now Sunday is reserved for uh doing school work for my grad class so so yeah um, uh, doing free games or extra games on top of what I already do yeah it's not that, any time for it that's but, that's yeah. that was my take on it anyways you guys are so busy running games that you just don't yeah. have time to do free you know freebie games with your friends which is I mean I guess that sort of leads into does it feel more like a job than before do you feel like you're working, Jojo? Uh, I, I'm still like D and D has been a passion of mine forever, and even like even on a day where like you know I'm feeling completely awful or shitty or sad, um, playing the, the game itself always picks me up. It's all it, it always gives me energy. It's always revitalizing. So in that sense, playing the game never feels like a job. Occasionally, there will be times where it'd be like, I need to make this map. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, I'm like, I just it, it, it gotta, I gotta, I gotta dedicate that time to do it. And that's fine. But like, I, I for the most part, no, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it feels like a job other than the crunching of time slots and having to uh, 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 find that work life balance that is so tough for a passionate hobby that has now is now a job and uh, and trying to uh, juggle home life and a relationship and uh, sanity at some point through all of that. Um, but yeah, so um, yeah, I, I don't I, lo I love it. I, I still I'm still it does not bother me in the slightest as a job. Okay, uh, RJ, do you feel like it's more of a job now than it used to be, or no? No, not really, because I'm very similar to JoJo in that uh, I really enjoy doing it. You know, uh, if it felt like a job to me, I probably wouldn't do it because I already have a job during the day. You know, and and like JoJo mentioned, it, it is sort of revitalizing. I, I often feel energized after having you know a session with my players. They have fun. I have fun, and I got paid on top of it. You know, so I know uh, like, it's amazing. The, the one thing to get paid for what yeah, you love and to do. So the one thing, yeah, so the, the one thing that does make it, again, not really feel like a job, but I feel more of an obligation. Like, you know, these people have yeah. paid for my time yeah. and, and I can't just cancel if I don't feel like it at the last minute. You know, uh, not right. that I, not that I'm a flake or not that I did that with my other groups or whatever, but you know, if I were running this many free games, well, I couldn't, I couldn't sustain this, you know? No way. Uh, so I always feel the, I always feel the, I, I have to play because I, I, I said that I would play, you know? Yeah. So, All right, two... so there, there is a little bit of an obligation, but it doesn't Sorry. feel like a job. Sorry. Uh, I, and it's I okay. get, I, actually, truth be told, I get that. I wasn't sure if doing mini paying commissions was going to feel more like a job, but I've been doing now for a few years and no, it doesn't. Uh, I yeah. still love it. More, more okay. like an obligation is a great way to phrase it last not even not even for me i just it's mm. it feels very normal to me it's just weird i should send out the minis instead of keep them uh, okay <laughs> so so two last questions uh the, all right so what is the one thing you wish you would have known before you started this venture rj 
Um, there's nothing really that I wish I would have known because by the time I started doing this, I'd been dungeon mastering for dungeon mastering for a while, and I already had kind of my style down and stuff like that. Um, you know, I I feel I started this in June, and I feel that the way I started it and the way I'm doing it now is pretty much the same. I haven't changed very much because I've been happy with what I'm doing. So, uh, in terms of any missteps that I think I've made. Uh, uh, nothing really that I can think of. I'm pretty happy with how I started. I'm pretty happy with how I'm going right now. That's good. All right, uh, Jojo, anything you wish you knew? Um, I feel like I, um, like I mentioned uh, previously, finding that work-life balance, being aware of, of how much time you can just lose yourself to it um, is when you're, when you're, when this is the job, it's easy to spend 80 hours a week just planning, writing, and world building, but that doesn't leave a lot of time for much else in your life. Uh, and so uh, I think uh, had I had, if, if me now could go and talk to me two years ago uh, about this venture, it would be um, scheduling prep time scheduling prep time before um and i would have i if i had i feel like if i had done that in the first year of of the of the of the job itself um i would have saved myself a lot of burnout uh last year that's fair i was gonna say because i actually got what is the best piece you gave, piece of advice you would give to somebody seeking to do this would that be it the uh, value your time would be would be what i would say in the, uh value the time that you put in to the game and understand that if people are paying you for this experience, your work is valuable and your time is valuable. And RJ, one piece of advice uh, uh, could be something different than what you just said. So in terms of a uh, piece of advice for someone who wants to become a professional dungeon master, I've given this before and I'll continue to say it. If you're doing this and people are paying you for your time, uh, Try to make every player feel like they're welcome at your table and try to make every character feel like they're important. If you can do those two things, then people are going to want to come back and play with you. Amen. Absolutely. 100% right. So, uh, well, actually, one, 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 one last thing. Have you guys published anything uh, that you want to tell us about? And also, how do we get a hold of you? So, Jojo. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at G underscore M underscore Jojo. Uh, I'm on there fairly regularly, although I, I don't certainly, I don't tweet up a storm all that often. No, you uh, don't. I follow you. We follow <laughs> each other. You don't. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm pretty quiet on there. I'm, I'm this is the last on. thing. Yeah. Um, and then uh, uh, JoeTheDM.com. If you want to send me an email, you can find all of my information on there. Um and uh, uh, actually, the the dungeon coach, who's a, a homebrew guy on YouTube, I've worked with him on a few of his monthly PDFs. So uh, his Dragon oh. Harbor City, for instance, I, I I did a number of the NPCs and uh, uh, and some work on on that one. So uh, the dungeon coach is someone I, I work with uh, regularly. So all right, RJ, anything? Let's see, anything you've published, uh, and how do people find you? Well, you know, I consider myself a creative. I used to be in a touring punk band, things like that. Uh, but in terms of like things related to Dungeons and Dragons, since I've really been doing this uh, since June, I have not really had time to publish things, create things for playing because I, all my time is spent being a dungeon master. Uh, but in terms of where you can find me, you can find me on Twitter at RJ underscore Cresswell, that's C-R-E-S-S-W-E-L-L. -S -S uh, I'm fairly active on there. I post a good bit about Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and occasionally I'll do little videos or something like that. Not very often, but you know, I'm always posting about, you know, minis that I've got some nice shots that I take of those. And, uh, some companies are very awesome and, and send me stuff in advance and I get to preview things for people on there. So if that's your bag, you know, definitely certainly come find me on Twitter. Uh, and then if you ever, you know, if you watch this and you think it'd be fun to play a game with me, you can certainly find me on startplaying.games and I'd be happy to run a game for you if I have time. You know what? And you know what? What the hell? I'll throw mine in there. You can find me at uh, at muses underscore touch. I may live, my focus is on mini painting, but I am always love to talk gaming, uh, anything gaming. So 
Um, but I've been pretty much posting a mini a day uh, as I've been doing a mini a day challenge. Uh, so with that, I want to thank you guys so much for coming to talk to everybody out there uh, about being a professional GM. I found it very interesting. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, let's see, what else? What's the usual stuff for you? Of course, yes. Follow us on Twitch. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, take a look at our YouTube archive of old episodes and such. Uh, if you want to see it at the table, contact us either on Twitter at mhoboink. Uh, everything's like mhoboink. Um, uh, of course, or Gmail at us, it's, which is at uh, mhoboink.gmail.com or at gmail.com. <laughs> uh, I know I've already screwed it up. Uh, you know, we have a Discord channel that's on somewhere on the overlay, as well as our shop where you can buy all sorts of Ritter Hobo uh, stuff or just general D&D stuff uh, that uh, Frank and I have created. Frank has done most of the creating. He's got a ton of things. So if you want, hey, if you want a, a skateboard deck or a duvet or probably, probably know a shower curtain or a towel, you can get our stuff on that too. <laughs> um, <laughs> um Instead, uh, let's see. So if you want to see the table, I got that. I got that. I got that. Uh, what about? Oh, yes, of course. Coming up this week, we have our cred campaign, which stands for Cthulhu Rises, Everyone Dies. I mentioned it. It is our awesome, if I do say so myself, because I'm actually one of the players. Uh, it's our basically our Cthulhu D&D &D, uh, campaign. Um, it is very scary and tremendously fun to play. So tune in. And we're not that far into it. And actually this week where we're sort of finished a plot and we're kind of going to the next section, not a bad time to jump in. Uh, on Saturday is our Calamity campaign, which is, uh, I believe it's Bronze Age. And I've watched them and they are an absolute riot. Uh, Frank is the GM for that. And <laughs> And oh my God, it's 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 a tremendous amount of fun. And then on Sundays we have the Margu campaign, which is a tri-generational campaign of, P of uh, one family, um, and all Franks, except for maybe I think like one or two people in that game. So it's uh, so please join us for other things, and you know you can check out any of the old episodes in the in YouTube. And I think that is it. Uh, oh, our, no, it's not it. Our sponsors, of course, Oddfish Games, makers of Adventure Sense. So if your game stinks, the room at least won't. And Pirate Dog Dice, who makers of really awesome commission custom dice. And I love my set so much. I might have to get a set for my new campaign character. So, uh, and I think that'll be it. Thank you all for tuning in. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at, the, at our campaigns.